Good morning, ladies. I'm still trying to get this thing straight or it's not bugging me. Okay, I think I'm there. Sorry, I've got it tucked in through the back of me and I'm like, Ugh. okay. So we're gonna get started this morning. And I was thinking as I was driving in and listening to your groups and stuff this morning, you know what the hardest part about teaching this chapter is this morning? I, I fall so short of where it's calling me or where I know I need to be in confession in my life. And I don't know if you were there this week, but I found this chapter to be extremely convicting. But with conviction, as we saw with Nehemiah, then we see growth. So I hope that you found that this week too. So last week we remember that Nehemiah was taking a census of the people and he was doing that to repopulate the city of Jerusalem. And then I thought how fabulous that God would, as God would have it, they landed on exactly the seventh month. And it says that they assembled as one before the water gate there in the square. Again, a perfect month to start over and rededicate their lives. And when we left off, Ezra was reading from the first five books of the law, and they were celebrating. If you remember the Feast of Tabernacles, and we had the blessing of having Teresa come and blow that shofar. Did y'all think that was cool? I just, I think it's so beautiful. Anyway, as they're studying God's word, they discover the command for them to celebrate that Feast of Tabernacles. And then they did. They did that by setting up those temporary booths and remembering that their ancestors wandered around in the desert for 40 years and they also were, were remembering God's faithfulness. So it tells us at the end of chapter eight that day after day, from the first day to the last, they were hearing God's word being taught. And their initial response, if you remember, was to weep because they were so convicted over their sin. But then Nehemiah and the Levites told them not to weep for them to celebrate because the joy of the Lord was their strength. And they could celebrate because they knew that the strength that God gave them to celebrate um, or to finish that wall, they could look to God and remember that it was all because of him. But now the time has come. They've done the exterior project, but now they're working on the interior. They're working on their heart. They had filled all the gaps in the walls, but now they're recognizing and seeing in their life that there are spiritual breaches, um, areas in their life where they know that they're not following what God is asking of them. And it's also the kind of project that we need in our daily lives. We can look really good on the outside. I can, you know, get up here and get cleaned up before I get here, but God really doesn't care about what I have on, uh, my makeup or whatever. He cares about what's going on inside of my heart. So my prayer for you all week, as well as for myself, and I have prayed a lot this week, it would be that we would listen with all our hearts to this chapter, that we would take to heart this prayer of confession and see the importance of mourning the sin in our lives. And as one commentator said, this chapter really doesn't need any teaching because it is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it, it's just straightforward. It teaches itself. So what we're studying this week is basically the battle of sin in our lives. In our lives, we see in the, the same thing in the Israelites' life. We see this cycle of sin. They cycle in and out of it. They're living right, as one table was talking about, and then they find they're living apart from God, and they confess, and God forgives them, and this cycle continues. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm confessing the same old sins all the time. Um, but I also recognize that the longer I walk with the Lord and the more that I'm in his word, I realize that I'm having more victory over the sin in my life. And ladies, this is the process of sanctification. Oh, my hoochie doo is not working. Okay, Darnell to the rescue. Oh, there it goes. Okay. 
So just like the Israelites were set apart to the Lord as believers, this side of heaven, we are also set apart, but we're also battling our sin. But we have the Holy Spirit within us to counsel us and to guide us and convict us of sin. And as this process of sanctification takes place, we're growing in holiness. And this continues, ladies, throughout our lives. We don't arrive um, this side of heaven until we get to see Jesus face to face. But this process doesn't mean that you're off the hook. It doesn't mean that God's going to do all the work. If you say that you want to grow in um, holiness and understanding and have more spiritual growth and your Bible remains closed, how serious are you? Because to become more like Christ and to grow in holiness, we need the study of his word. We need to fellowship with other believers. We need that accountability. We need to worship the Lord, serve the Lord, and confess our sins. So last week at the end of chapter eight, on the eighth day, it says that in accordance with the regulation, there was this assembly. And if you remember, I said it kind of left us hanging. And that's where we're picking up this week when we're talking about this assembly. So let me pray as we get started this morning. Father, um, I just thank you, Lord, that you would allow me to teach this chapter, Lord, because I know that I fall so seriously short of mourning my sin. But I pray, Father, that um, as we journey through this chapter together, Lord, that we would see the necessity of um, confronting our sin confessing our sin, remembering, Lord, that you forgive our sin and you cleanse us, Lord, from all unrighteousness. So be with us this morning as we open up your word and teach us, Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. So go ahead and open your Bibles with me and let's look at chapter nine, verse one. It says, on the 24th day, of the same month, the Israelites gathered together fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Now, we don't do that, um, ladies, but this was an outward sign that their heart was just wrenched. This is showing that they have extreme remorse and repentance and grief. And many of you are probably familiar with the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter five. And one of them, the second one says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. How, much, how often have you said that to somebody when they're sad? Or maybe when someone has experienced a death in their family. Um, our small group did the book called The Blessing of Humility by Jerry Bridges, which I highly recommend. But in it, he talks about what it means to mourn or what it means to mourn. And like I said, we think of it often um, differently than Jesus actually intended, um, us, intended for us. So what it actually means is that we are to mourn our sin. It goes on to say that one of the most, or Jerry Bridges goes on to say that one of the most difficult traits to grow in, but one that all Christians should desire to grow in, is to mourn our sin. Each of the eight Beatitudes, they address a specific attitude of the heart. And in this one, Jesus is... Um, addressing our attitude towards our own personal sin. He explains that mourning is not just a touch of sadness, but it is an actual deep, heartfelt grief over our sin. And he also goes on to say that very few Christians today ever really experience this kind of mourning over their sin. But Jesus says that when we do, we're blessed. He says, and I quote, despising the law of God is not only an expression of rebellion, it's also a despising of God's very character, since his law is a reflection of his character. And this is true not only with the heinous sins like um, adultery and murder, but it's also those refined sins in our lives like pride and selfishness and gossip and things like that. So Let's pray that God will allow us as we look through this chapter to see the rebellion in our hearts. And then, um, okay, I lost my place. 
I don't know where I was going with that. Okay, anyway, as we look further into this chapter, I think that what we're gonna see is that the Israelites are really, this is what they're doing. They are genuinely mourning their sin. And it tells us at the very end of the chapter in verses 36 and 37 that they're indeed mourning their sin because they recognize it. They recognize the reason that they find that they're slaves in the land that God has given them. They didn't honor God. They're in distress plain and simple over their sin. And revival, ladies, begins in our lives when we own our stuff, when we mourn our sin and we repent of it. Verse two says, those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. Now, the first thing that we need to remember is that God set the Jews apart as his chosen people. And he did that, if you remember when you studied Genesis, he did that because he made that covenant with Abraham. However, they're not living as God's chosen people. They're supposed to be a witness to the world, but they're not. They're part of the world. They're living just like the people around them. In the book of Ezra, he addresses this specifically in relation to intermarriage with unbelievers, but we need to understand that the separation he's talking about here is not that. It's not an issue of racism or culture. It was because God was preserving this covenant people. He was setting them apart as a holy seed because this is the line that his son, Jesus Christ, came through. And this was not exclusive, however, because foreigners could also put their faith in the God of Israel and they would be adopted or grafted in to um, the faith as well. So calling them to be separate meant that they were not to associate with pagan worship around them. Now remember, they were surrounded by pagan worshipers. It was just a horribly immoral, uh, sexually saturated culture that was around them. And the nations would even, around them would even sacrifice their infants to the God of Molech by throwing them into the furnace of fire alive. And in our nation today, far too often, we offer up or we sacrifice our children on the altar of sports and education and extracurricular activities, but we can't seem to find time to teach them God's word or allow them to be in activities at church. Um, Often, I will tell you, I've looked back as a mother and that's been one of my biggest regrets. My children did grow up in the church. They grew up to know the Lord. But I can tell you, we spent far too much time on things that had no eternal significance. And the Jews, they realized this. They realized that they were living the exact opposite of where God was calling them to live. And if you'll look with me at verse 2. It says, they stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worship of God. And I thought, when was the last time you spent 30 hours in confession? Anybody? When was the last time you spent 30 minutes? I'm asking myself the same question. Um, they despise or they desire to obey God's law. And we need to recognize that we need to do that too. We need to hear God's word so that we know what it says. Because if we don't know what God's word says, how can we know that we're living apart from God's will? They recognize their need for God's word, remember, because they ask Ezra, to bring the book and to read it to them. Then we saw the reverence as they stood and they listened attentively and it didn't fall on deaf ears because they responded. Like what good does it do for us to study God's word week in and week out and then not have our lives look any differently or live any differently? And what leads them to repentance? It was the hearing and the understanding of God's word. What we're studying in this chapter is a prayer of confession that overflows as a result of hearing God's word. This is called revival. And I'm older, but back in the day, some of you that are younger won't remember, but churches would have revivals that would last a week or two weeks 
or even a weekend where they would read and study God's word and they would pray and come together and confess their sins. And that's what we're seeing here with the Israelites. So the Levites, it says in verses four and five, they call out in a loud voice to the people and they tell them to stand up and praise the Lord their God who is from everlasting to everlasting. So verses six through 31 are one long prayer. In fact, it's thought to be the longest prayer in the Bible. They're praying back to God the story that God has acted out in the history of the Israelites. They're basically summarizing the entire Old Testament in one prayer. And it's interesting to note that Ezra chapter nine, Daniel chapter nine, and Nehemiah chapter nine are all confessions of prayer. Um, and, and they're beautiful. And each one contains incredible wisdom from God. And it also talks about God's mercy and grace. And they start where they should with who God is. And that's what I want y'all to do. I want us to stand up and read verse six together. It says, you alone are the Lord. We're reading it together. <laughs> You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is in it, on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You can sit, be seated. So that means as you sit down in the breath that you just sucked in, God gave it to you because he gives life to everything. They recognize who God is and they begin in Genesis by worshiping God as the God of all creation. God speaks to us through his word and we in turn worship him by reading and hearing his word that speaks to us. We worship him by praising him as they did for who he is. We worship him by confessing our sins and we also worship him by separating ourselves from the world around us. It's interesting, one of the tables in the back, they're like, so what does that mean like to be in the world but not of the world but be part of the world and love the world? I mean, it gets confusing, doesn't it? Um, I think we'll see as we go through this chapter a little bit more about what that looks like. So in verses seven and eight, they recognize God as the one who made the covenant with Abraham. Remember, he renames Abraham, and this is actually the only other place in scripture that talks about God changing Abram's name to Abraham, but Abraham is a new man now, and God found his heart to be faithful. So God made this covenant with Abraham to bless his de descendants, but it wasn't dependent upon Abraham to keep that covenant. God kept that covenant. And then they go on. He's the God who heard their cry at the Red Sea. He parted it, allowed them to pass through on dry ground, and then bury their pursuers in a wall of water. He sent them signs and wonders in the forms of plagues to Pharaoh because of how he treated the Jews. He's the God who led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He's the God that came down on Mount Sinai and gave Moses the 10 commandments that were just and right and good. He made known to them the Sabbath because he knew that we would need time for worship and for rest. He gave them bread from heaven in the form of dew each morning. And then it says that he brought water from a rock. He allowed them to go in and take possession of the land that he swore that he would give them. And John Piper points out, and I quote, the main lesson from Nehemiah and indeed the entire Bible is that God does not exist for the sake of our enjoying Bible stories. Biblical stories exist for the sake of our knowing and enjoying God. There is a point to the story and that point is a person. God wrote the story of history, his story, to reveal to us who he is, what he's like, his character. And what was God doing in all these stories with all these miraculous signs and wonders? What was he doing? Well, Piper points out, it tells us, look at verse 10. He was making a name for himself, which remains to this day. To what day? 
to the day of Nehemiah at that time in 400 BC. And when else? At the Exodus, 1400 years before that, 1000 years before that. So what's the point of the story? God is making himself a name so that this people then and us today We can believe in him, we can know him, we can trust him, we can worship him, count on him, praise him, and spend all eternity. This is the God that led the nation of Israel, and this is the God that supplied all their needs, and this is our God too. Now, like I said, I prayed a lot about this passage this week, that we would each have a fresh wind from the Holy Spirit, that we would have a similar encounter with God that the Israelites did, I prayed and I asked God that each of us had the opportunity to look back over our lives at all the ways that God has cared for us. I prayed that you don't take those blessings for granted. I talked to God myself and I thanked him because he is the God who called me from darkness to light at the age of 19. I thanked him for his patience with me because he was my savior long before he was the Lord of my life. I thanked him that he didn't strike me dead for calling myself a Christian and not living anything like one. I thanked him that he provided wonderful women to mentor and to pray for me as a young wife who really had a hard time those first few years of marriage and gave me a wonderfully patient husband. I thanked him because he helped me parent when I had no clue what I was doing and I was a mother who raised my voice far too often. I thanked him that he helped me forgive those who abused me as a child. I thanked him that he sustains me today. I thanked him that he took my husband to a conference in Galveston this week so I had time to study. I thanked him because his mercies are new every morning and I thanked him for his word because it sustains me. And did you encounter him like this? I prayed that you did. Is this your God and is this how you begin your prayers by remembering who God is? I hope so because we need to. Again, this prayer follows the acrostic that I gave you a couple of weeks ago. Before we come to God with all we want, we need to recognize he's all we need. We need to have a reverent, humble recognition of who God is. Do we approach him with the same awe and respect that we saw that the Israelites did and then follow him, recognizing who he is and our need to confess? So how did it say in verses 16 and 17, how did it say that their ancestors responded? I don't know if I'm clicking or Darnell's clicking. (laughs) It says, but they are ancestors They became arrogant and stiff-necked and they did not obey your commands. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. I like to call this the myth of the greener grass. They wanted out of Egypt and they saw how miraculously God delivered them and then what did they do? They whined and they wanted to go back. It's like they totally forgot about all the beatings and the oppression from Pharaoh. They wanted to go back to making bricks out of straw and back to the sensual pleasures of Egypt. They grumbled against Moses. They wanted to stone him, but what did Moses do? He cried out to God on their behalf. Why? God forgave them, but why? Why did he do that? Because he is a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, and he's slow to anger and he's abounding in love. God didn't desert them even when they went to the point of casting an image made to look like a calf and worshiped it while Moses was on the mountain. And then Moses' brother Aaron, he lied about it. He said that the, they gave them all or they gave him all their gold earrings and such and that he threw it into the fire and poof, this calf came out. He had no idea where it came from. But then I thought, don't we do that? Do we grievously sin and then say, I'm not sure how I got into this mess. That's exactly what we do. Look at verse 19 in your Bibles. Because of his great compassion, he didn't abandon them to the wilderness, but he gave them that pillar of cloud to guide them by day and a pillar of fire by night. 
So I have to ask you, what's guiding you? We have the manna of God's word to guide us if we're willing to open it and apply it to our lives. John 1, 1 tells us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And that word is Jesus. And then in John 1, 14, it tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, fully God and fully man, came and dwelt on this earth for a time. And then Jesus himself tells us in John chapter six that he is the bread of life. How are you feeding on God's word on a daily basis to give you direction and wisdom in your life? Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And we know too that Jesus is the light of the world. He quenched their thirst with water from the rock, but we have something better. Look at verse 20. We also have his good spirit as believers to instruct us and his spirit is our living water in this dry and parched land. John 7, 38 says, whoever believes in me as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. God sustained them and he sustains us. And what else did they worship God for doing? It said he gave them kingdoms and nations. He, gave, uh, he made their children as numerous as the stars in the sky, just like he promised. He brought them into the promised land because God subdued those Canaanites and gave them into the hands of the Israelites along with their kings and peoples of the land. But not only that, they got to keep all the plunder that they got to keep all the good things, the wells that they didn't dig, the vineyards and olive groves and fruit trees that they didn't plant. They got to have all of this abundance. And what did they do? They became fat and happy. Do we do that? Do we bask in the abundance of God's grace and forget where our blessings come from? Look with me at verse 26. But they were disobedient and they rebelled against you. They turned their backs on your law. They killed your prophets who warned them in order to turn them back to you. They committed awful blasphemies. And if you remember that crazy spaghetti bowl slide that I showed you, the chronological order of the Bible, a little crazy. But I highlighted this time the prophets because I wanted you to see that these are the prophets that God sent to warn them over and over to turn back. He gave them wicked kings to rule over them, but nothing got their attention. They trampled all over God's grace. And what did God do? It tells us in verse 27. He gave them over into the hands of their enemies. Again, they cry out. God hears them because he is a God of great compassion and mercy. He sent deliverers to them. And then in verses 28 and 29, the cycle continues. Back to their enemies they go, crying out to God, God having compassion and delivering them again and again. Look with me at verses 30 and 31. It says, for many years you were patient with them. By your spirit, you warned them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention. So you gave them into the hands of their neighboring peoples. That's when God split the kingdom into the northern and southern kingdom. They, they were scattered and drug off some to Assyria and then some to Babylon. But in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. And I have to say, every good parent comes to the end of themselves, don't they? But God does it perfectly, and he does it at just the right time. He gave them hundreds of years to turn back and repent. And when they didn't, he gave them over to their enemies, but he didn't completely destroy them or abandon them because of his grace and mercy. So the exiles... They're at the end of themselves, though, regarding their sin and that of their ancestors. We see that they are crying out to God in verse 32 on the basis of who God is, just like Nehemiah did. If you remember back in chapter one, he cried out to God and asked God to be attentive to his prayers because he knew who God was. Now, therefore, and they're looking back and thinking, God is... He's now their God. He's, they're saying our God. They're remembering that he is great and mighty and awesome. He's a covenant keeper. He's righteous. He's faithful. And then they're recognizing who they are. 
They recognize and recount in this entire chapter how they and their ancestors were arrogant. I don't know what happened. (laughs) Back one or back one. There we go. How they were arrogant and stiff-necked and disobedient. They were bad listeners, idol worshipers, rebellious, blasphemous, and evil. And did you notice, though, in verse 32 that there's a shift? It was they and them, but now it's us and we an hour, because now they're starting to look at their own generation. Throughout this miraculous pilgrimage, Derek Kidner points out, they lacked nothing and they appreciated nothing. And do you wonder, do you look at the stories of the Israelites and you think, how could they be so ungrateful? How could they be so hard hearted? But as we read and we listen and we look at this, we have the same propensities that they do. And I heard this as I was listening this morning. So Adolf Eichmann, who during World War II was one of Hitler's top angels of death, it says from 1939 to 1945, he was in charge of exterminating the Jews in Germany. Over six million people were murdered under his very efficient administration. After the war, he escaped to South America, and this is where he lived until 1960 when the Israeli secret police found him. He was extradited to Israel. He was put on trial for the atrocious crimes he committed against the Jews. But one of the survivors of the Holocaust, whose name was Yehil Denyer, he's called on to testify against Eichmann. When Denyer confronted Eichmann in the Israeli courtroom, he began to shout and sob uncontrollably. Finally, he collapsed to the floor. And everybody assumed that the reaction that he had was because he was starting to remember the horrible atrocities of the death camps in Germany. But later in an interview, he tells them why. He said, I saw... Eichmann, and I expected to see the personification of evil, some kind of moral monster. But as he gazed into Eichmann's eyes, he said he realized for the very first time that sin and evil are natural human conditions. Denyer said, I saw that I am capable to do this exactly like he This article goes on to say that Eichmann was not a madman. Hitler and bin Laden were not sociological mutations, but the same sinful nature which erupted murderously in their lives resides in the child of, in every child of Abraham. To see this and to believe it is to be brought to our knees just like Yehil Denyer. Ladies, against this Black backdrop of our sin shines the brilliance of God's unbelievable grace. It shines like a diamond on a black cloth that is flawless and beautiful. It's through Jesus Christ, his life and his death and his resurrection that we are able to conquer the sin in our lives. It's his spirit that changes our depraved hearts and gives us new life. He forgives those who trust in him and we can trust him to one day return and eradicate the evil in this world. So it's easy for us to look at all the grace and mercy that God extended to the Jewish people and say, well, If I had seen all those miracles, I would have believed too. Or if I had a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, well, of course I would believe. And of course I would follow after God. Or if I had manna and didn't have to cook dinner every night and it was delivered, of course I would believe in God. I would follow him wholeheartedly. But like what were they thinking? But we aren't any different, but we wanna think we are. We wanna think that we could never be like the Hitlers and Bin Ladens of this world. But apart from Christ, we're all depraved and without hope. The remnant of these these people, these exiles, that return to the city are being rebuilt now from the inside out. How? Remember that this prayer is a confession that followed the extended days of reading and understanding God's word. God's word showed them the true condition of their hearts. And it tells us in Hebrews 4.12, 
For the word of God is active and alive, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And when we study and apply God's word, it's like doing open heart surgery. And I don't know about you, but I felt like that all the way through Nehemiah. God has been doing some daily open heart surgery on me. And again, we would rather compare ourselves to everybody else and think, well, I'm not as bad as that guy or I'm not as bad as she is because like, you know, whatever, you can fill in the blank and I've never been a murderer or an adulterer or a liar or a thief, but we murder people in our hearts by the things we think and we also commit spiritual adultery against God when we follow after the idols of this world. And we steal time from God when we make much lesser things a priority. We think nothing of spending an hour on social media, but we just can't find time to crack open his word. But did you notice that the Jewish exiles, they don't make excuses? What do they say in verse 33? They say, in all that has happened to us, you have been just. You have acted faithfully while we did not. The exiles got it. They got it. They recognized and repented of the mess that their very own sin got them into. Like I said a few weeks back, progress is painful. Recognizing the sin in our lives is a painful process, but it's productive and it's necessary in the process of restoration. It's part of the ongoing process of sanctification. We need daily, sometimes moment by moment confession. Some days I'm confessing before I get out of bed in the morning for the things I think about when I wake up. And one commentator said that there's a paradox in the Christian life. The longer you walk with God, the more godly you become. And yet, the more godly you become, the more you are aware of the terrible depravity of your own heart. Paul realized this too because he called himself the worst of sinners. Even though in our daily walk we grow in holiness as we study God's word and come to know him, we also begin to recognize how prone to sin we really are. Look at verses 36 and 37. It says, but see, we are slaves today, slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you've placed over us. They rule over our bodies, our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. Their sin of confession begins by recognizing who God is and his many attributes. And it's followed with a mixture of confession and praise and worship and thanksgiving because God did not give them over to what they deserved. Yes, they're in distress because of their choices, but often part of digging yourself out of the mess that you find you're in, yourself in starts with recognizing how you got there in the first place, and that journey is hard. It's not um, what most of us would relish, um, that process of sanctification. It can be difficult, but remember that Nehemiah starts with conviction at the very beginning of this book, but that conviction is what led him to action. The Israelites have gotten to the place that they're tired of being enslaved to their sin. They're tired of dragging around the same old sin. They want a fresh start. They wanna make a binding agreement and they're willing to put it in writing. Look at verse 38. It says, in view of all this, we're making a binding agreement and we're putting it in writing and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their official seals to it. They didn't just have remorse over all their sins, but they had genuine repentance. And what's the difference? Remorse blames others or circumstances. It grieves over the consequences more than the sin and it turns to self and not to God. But genuine repentance, but they had genuine repentance because they're accepting the blame, they're turning from their sin to follow God, and they're putting it in writing and they're going public with it. So how are you dealing with your sin? Are you dealing with it through the blame game, blaming your, how you were brought up, your parents, society, the temptations, 
social media, et cetera, or are you experiencing genuine repentance? An ongoing repentance is something we do, like I said, for the rest of our lives. And we need to take our sin seriously. And as John Piper says, we need to be sin killers. We need to take necessary steps to break free. If you've accepted Christ, he took your sins to that cross. He grants us repentance and saving faith as gifts. But sometimes progress requires some counseling or some outside help to rid yourself of specific sins or addictions. And I can tell you it has certainly helped me. Um, So don't shy away if you need some help from a professional counselor. And then don't let the enemy get in your head either and make you think, I'm never gonna overcome this sin. Because remember who he is, he's a liar. Do you find it hard to repent? Did you find this chapter difficult? I did. I doubt many of us walk around thinking, man, I'm such a sinner. James Boyce says, nothing is harder or goes more against the grain of our sinful natures than confession. But it's necessary for personal happiness and for God's blessing. The promise is if we will repent of our sins, then God will heal hear us from heaven, forgive us our sins, and heal us. He is indeed our way maker. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these hard chapters, these hard lessons, Lord, for reminding us that you don't desire that we stay in our sin, Lord. You desire that we come to you, that we ask for forgiveness, Lord, that we genuinely repent and that we take the steps like the Israelites did to free ourselves from the bondage of the sin that we find ourselves in. Thank you, Lord, that as we study your word, as we walk with you and learn from you, Lord, you begin to slowly release those sins. Now, yes, it can be like a -a whack-a-mole, Lord. We continue to battle these sins, but you are so faithful, Father. And we thank you and we praise you for the power of your Holy Spirit and the way that you continue to teach us and refine us. In your precious name, amen.